we're going to do is Josh called me and he said we'll be continuing from the book of Ephesians. Uh, about a lifetime ago or a few months ago, we started the book of Ephesians. Uh, and then we had like a time for culture and then we did some other series. Uh, now we are back into looking at Ephesians. And so that's what we are going to continue. Um, we're gonna, what we're going to do today, uh, where we stopped last time, uh, was Ephesians 2, chapter 10. So that's where we stopped. So I would like you to turn your Bibles uh, to Ephesians 2, 11 to 22, right? And that's what we are going to continue doing today. Ephesians 2, 11 to 22. Let me give a quick recap. Uh, <clears throat> like if you watch these series and all, when there's a season two coming, they have to recap on what's happening. So the first five, 10 minutes is about a quick recap. Um, so Ephesians, as you know, is written by Paul. And if we want to know about how Paul started that church, uh, we can move to Acts chapter 19. So if you put one finger on Ephesians uh, and go to Acts chapter 19, um, wh what, what you will see is Paul's uh, uh, in, uh, entry into Ephesus. Um, chapter 19, and it happened that while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed through inland country and came to Ephesus, and there he found some disciples. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no, uh, we, have not e uh, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, into John the, John's baptism. So there's a group of people here, they're familiar with John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptized with, uh, with the baptism of repentance, telling people to believe the one who was to come after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began prophesying in tongues, and there were about 12 men in all. All right, so here is Paul. He's entering into Ephesus. He gains a group of 12 men. And you see that a lot of what he does is mimic what Jesus does, because he sees power in that. There's something that Christ is doing that's powerful. So a lot of what he does is to mimic that, to be able to bring that. Uh, and then you see that in verse 8, he starts off by going into the synagogue first. He's there in the synagogue for three months, and he's speaking. Uh, and then after that, uh, because he finds difficulty there, people are not listening, he goes to the uh, center. He goes to the hall of Tyrannus. That's like almost saying, I'm not able to get your attention, so I go to a particular news channel or somewhere else where I'm able to get another more secular audience. And he goes there. But whatever we see, the church has thrived. Right. So when we come to uh, the book of Ephesians, we know that whatever Paul did in Eph Ephesus, and it goes on here, it has thrived. It is a successful mission. All right. So he starts off his base there, and then he goes out, which has something to say here. You know, I did, um, recently I've been reading some management books, because somehow my work requires me to do some management, managing people, uh, and I, I have no background in it. My engineering or my seminary didn't give me any of those skills. Uh, but one of the things that I was reading in, in those books, uh, particularly by Peter Drucker, uh, like this famous management person, is that whenever you start a new venture, make sure that you set up a very strong base. All right. Make sure that you set up a very strong known base for yourself before you go and start off on your venture. Um, and just when I was reading this, that was what came into my mind. Here is Paul. He's starting a new venture. But first, he's starting off a very strong base here. These 12 disciples, and then first in the synagogue who already has some understanding of their history, and then he moves into a completely new venture. So obviously Paul is not reading any of these, uh, or he's not aware of these management principles, but you see that something very pragmatic in what he's doing. There's a very strong pragmatic management element of what he's doing here. All right, so that's Acts, and that is Paul's entry into Ephesus, and then we go into a few years later, he's going to be in prison, <coughs> and he is going to write the book of Ephesians. Uh, first, you have uh, just a quick re recap on that. The first part, verse 3 onwards, is poetry. All right, so from verse 3 to 14 is actually poetry. Uh, we might not get the whole poetic uh, what uh, brilliance of it by reading it in English, but uh, let's take it that it was beautiful poetry. It's written in beautiful language, um, and it's about Jesus, and, and it's about adoption, adoption into God's sonship. And I remember Josh was the one who preached on this a few months back, so I guess that really touched him very deep inside uh, that he went, goes out and practically does this particular sermon that he preached, being adopted into the family of Christ. So that's the poetry there. And then after that, you have Thanksgiving. That's verses 15 to 23, you have Thanksgiving. 
and then after that you have Paul's understanding of grace through faith. You know that famous verse that we studied in Sunday school. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. All right, so that's where the story is as of now. All right, so Paul is writing to the Ephesians. He starts off with poetry, then he prays for them, and then he talks about how we have all come to God, how we have all come to God uh, through grace in faith. Then we have uh, chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. What I would encourage us to do now is to read it quietly, if we can do that. All right, read chapter 2, verse 11 to 22, quietly and prayerfully. And what I want you to think of is, what is the main idea that is conveyed here? All right, what do you think is the main idea? There's no per perfect or right answer here. But as you read it, what do you feel is the main idea in 11 to 22, the main theme that is there? All right, so maybe we can have a quick three or four minutes for that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 11 to 22. right any thoughts on what do you think is the main idea that's conveyed here from 11 to 22 yes sir All right, so if you heard what Velima is saying, both the Jews, Jews are the circumcised, the Gentiles are the uncircumcised. In the Old Testament, it was only for the Jews. That how are you a covenant family? Biologically, you know, biologically and ethnically by the Jewish people, you are part of the family of God. But here, what Paul is saying is, no, both of you are almost on the same plane here. Both of you need Christ, the circumcised and the uncircumcised. So bringing together the worldwide family of God you know, that would be the idea there, bringing together the worldwide family of God. Definitely a very strong theme that comes out in those passages. Anything else? Okay. All right. All right. And so that comes particularly in the end ish. That, yes. Verses 18 For through him we both have access in one spirit through the Father. Uh, that there is no wall of separation. No? There is something called, uh, verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. All right. Uh, and uh, obviously that's te talking about the Jewish temple and we'll come to that, that wall that kind of separates us. He's using a lot of metaphors, a lot of figures saying, okay, there's a wall that was separating us, but now that has dissolved in and through what Christ has done, it's dissolved and we are bringing together brought together and we have access. So that would be a, a point that he takes to bring out. Access. Access to God. Anything else? Yes. Huh? Okay. Uh, okay. Can
can you explain more of noise? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's, that's a very important point that uh, comes out here. I'm just scared that you'll all just preach my sermon here. Uh, but that's, that's exactly the point that I would want to bring out uh, in some time. That, that, uh, that thing, that, uh, that unity, that tribe of unity that is there is transcending from material aspects of the temple and things like that to a spiritual, to the spiritual aspect of the temple, the spiritual aspect of the church. Yes. Huh? Okay. that's also connected to what Noel is saying that it is the it is the spiritual unity that is there but on what 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 is the foundation Christ is the cornerstone of, of that if not there is no unity that that unity will collapse you know, and Koji is bringing that in great any other thing apart from what has mentioned yeah huh? okay anything in that word Okay, so you're particularly focusing on dwelling place, like a place of worship. Okay, okay. It's connected to the temple idea, you would say? Is it connected to the temple, the idea of the temple as God's dwelling place? using the symbol or the metaphor of a building but it's moving towards a corporate body and also like a lot more spiritual a spiritual understanding a reimagining of it all right great and that is the main ideas those are the three main ideas that i want to be looking at so verse 11 to 13 all right so verse 11 to 13 is what we had Veliama say that this whole division between those who are circumcised and those who are uncircumcised all right and it's breaking of that hostility to come together. And it's a very strong idea, especially for the Jewish people. It's a very strong idea because for them, uh, how were they saved? Okay, in what way were they saved? They were very clearly ethnically cut off, that there was a boundary. And what really created that boundary was the law, all right, the Sinai covenant, you know, the law which is given to Moses, which you see in the Torah, which is still, you know, revered today. That is the wall that separates them. Now, what we should understand is it is not a wall to separate them, particularly from us and them. The main idea here is that when God called Abraham, they were called to be a blessing to the people around. That they are not supposed to be an ethnically superior community. It's not a caste system type of a thing. But the fact that when you are living in this world uh, and you're thrown into the world, all right, here is the Middle Eastern community, there are different ideologies that are going around. There are different worldviews that are there all over. And these are very what uh, practiced culturally very deep. Uh, and, and it comes out in their culture. And here God is calling these people to set apart them so that they can communicate, they can connect with the with their true God. All right. With the God who has made a covenant promise with them. Now, the thing is that if you mingle with those around which have very different ideologies what will become much more easy for any community to do is assimilate things that are easier for the flesh. It becomes very easy to assimilate things because it becomes a lot more appealing. Here circumcision also in symbolically had a lot to do with harnessing your impulses. Right? Uh, sexual impulse being one very prominent one in human being. And circumcision in one sense is to harness those impulses which come very easily. Because what you have around with all the other, whether it be Assyrian or Mesopotamian and all these other cults, is a type of indulgence of the body, whether it's uh, what food or you know physical relationship, and it is deified, it's done on the altar, there are orgies, there it's all these different communities with very different ways of life that are there. And so God's call to bring them out is not so that they can you know think of themselves as superior but it is a necessary period that they have to be incubated. If not, the worldviews around will ultimately be, will corrupt them. 
when you come when jesus comes he has no problem in going and engaging with the samaritan woman because that's who he is it's too much to assume that the israelites would take up that type of position but we should always know and paul always points to that that the ultimate reality is to include them into the family that the ultimate way or the ultimate goal which paul feels that he is in the climax of it all right jesus christ he is in the climax of it is ultimately to bring together the worldwide family of god to assimilate rather than segregate it is to bring them together and follow and worship the true god i want to give an example here uh, which kind of can kind of uh, drive home the point it's not from a great source it's from tinkle uh, something that i really enjoyed reading right before exams so i hope your kids are not doing that right now um, but apart from supandi and tantri the mantri there were some moral stories that they used to give you know there's little thing of more more pages you have to read in order to get those stories so in that story it was a very wealthy father who had two sons all right and they were married and they had kids uh, one of the sons and things like that wants to be very disciplined and wants to take over the father's business he wants to take over the father's business he sees that the father has started something from scratch and he's very passionate about it very focused and then he kind of drives that into the family and his workers and things like that and then there is the other son uh, who is uh, born into uh, he feels is anyway born into privilege there's always so much profit that is there and so his thing is to just extract that profit and to enjoy and so his life is a lot more indulgent uh, his life is a lot more lavish uh, which the other son is not he is a lot more frugal he's thinking of other things other parameters that is there and at one point there's a huge break in the family whereas this son who is frugal and things like that feels that he needs to cut off because it's adversely affecting his workers who are connected it and his own family his child is a lot more now indulgent and things like that and he feels that he needs to break away from the family and it creates a lot of rift that is there um and then he 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 moves away and so he is secluded as opposed to them and then a few years down the other son's business fails it completely fails it collapses and then he calls on this elder, uh, the other brother and then he comes and then he helps him re- restart his business there right um it doesn't totally get the point but to some degree that you see that there is a momentary cut off there is a need to com- kind of isolate yourself not for the long run ultimately it is to unite but it becomes necessary and what paul says in uh, in all his letters is that the law was a temporary structure that was needed but after the advent of christ we have a higher law we have a greater law we have a greater understanding which can which is which is because of which it is now possible to assimilate it is now possible to come together all right so that is the first point and that's the point that william has said here the bringing together of the jews and gentiles which is not a new idea it was an idea that always was there abraham's calling it is through you i you will be a blessing to the nations around it was always the calling of is it's not something new that paul has realized what paul does is look at the old testament and he sees in and through jesus what was promised has come to material reality all right now verse 14 to 18 all right and here we have what anil said about jesus being the cornerstone verse 14 to 18 for he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinance that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two so making peace and might reconcile both to god in one body through the cross through the cross thereby killing the hostility and he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you that was near for through him we both have access in one spirit to the father this might be a little difficult for us to totally grasp here all right but what what you see here and especially in the tone of the way in which the letter each letter has a tone you know and uh, thing you know when you write a last uh, very harsh letter and if you are from another culture you might not be able to see uh, but you, the the tone is harsh you know the type of language and things like that is harsh so here in the tone of paul's letter paul does place more onus on the jews in order to understand throughout his letter and especially here pointed because his under, his his claim is that for the jews your revelation is so much more you have for 2000 years all right with the mosaic covenant 
your revelation and what God has revealed to you is so much more. That any time there is a conflict with Jews and Gentiles, he says, yes, we are all united in Christ. But in and through his stone, because he, and he himself is a Jew, all right, he himself is a Pharisee, and so he's speaking to his people, all right. The push is that the Jews are expected to understand this more. That in and through this conflict that is there, there is more onus on the Jews to understand because the Gentiles are now adopted into the family of God. You know, it might be a something that, uh, you know, we, we see that in, in our own life, you know, when uh, our children are uh, having some conflict with another children, there is some expectation on our part for, to, for our child to understand. You know, the others are new, it's not something that we have control of or total control of. But there's always more onus on our own children to kind of understand in the situation. In Paul's thing, he's bringing the Messiah in and he's pointing to the Jews that this is your heritage to some extent. This is comes from your lineage. So the greater onus of understanding, the greater onus of sacrifice um, lies with you. And maybe that is something for us to really think about that in whatever conflicts that we find ourselves, whether it's a family conflict or work conflict, because of the revelation that we have and because of the working that God works in and through your life, the onus of the greater sacrifice, unfortunately, or fortunately, lies on those in whom Christ dwells. Those in whom throughout the ages have walked in and through the person of Christ. That there is a greater onus here. And he brings that idea out here. He brings that Christ being that cornerstone. Christ is the one who has, you know, broken that hostility. If Christ has broken that hostility, then is a thing, then what is your calling? And this comes out very strongly. Again, it is not something that is particularly thrown in Ephesians. If you could turn your Bibles with me to Genesis 15, and this is a very striking passage that is there. Genesis 15, and I want to look at 8 to 21. I won't read the whole thing. But let's uh, just to summarize this covenant God has with Abraham that really makes sense uh, in what Christ has done and what Paul is trying to say in uh, Ephesians. So here is a covenant that God is making with Abraham and God calls Abraham and he says in verse 10, verse 9, he said to them, uh, he said to him, that God said to him, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him them, cut them into half, lay each half over and against the other. But he said, do not cut the birds in half. Now, these, it sounds very gruesome, very culturally alien from us. But what God is asking uh, Abraham to do is take all these animals, split them into half, cut them into half, and then put them aside here. All right? And this is very uh, connected to the culture of its time, particularly to treaties that are being made by different chiefs or different kings. So how they do it, like how we have signature and a handshake and things like that, uh, in their culture is a little more dramatic. They take these animals, they cut them into half, and they place the animal like that, and then both the chiefs walk through it. All right, both these heads walk through it. And the idea is that if, if we break this covenant, which we have promised, then whatever has happened to these animals has ha can happen to us. So that is the treaty that is there. So you're making the symbolism says, if I break, here is a contract that is there. I, I decide to do this, you decide to do this, but if I break my contract, what happened to these things will be my same thing. You can do this to me also, all right? And so that is the treaty that is there. So if the animal is cut into half, and here what uh, we have in verse 17 is, so Abraham does it, he cuts it uh, into half, and he says, when the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed through these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham to your offspring. And so the idea that is conveyed here is, here is this covenant, and both these chiefs have to walk through. But in Abraham's case, Abraham falls asleep, all right? And the smoking pot, which is a representation of God, El, uh, the God he's made a covenant to, only God passes through. And the idea that is very clearly conveyed is that God makes a covenant with his people, and the idea is that even if the people do not keep their command, or do not keep their end of the commitment, the consequences will not be suffered by Abraham, but God himself will take the suffering for it. That even if you don't keep your part of the bargain, or even if you don't keep up to your part of the commitment, God will sacrifice himself. 
And it is that idea, a deeply embedded Old Testament idea that we see physically manifested on the cross. That as Jesus Christ is dying, it is this idea that Israel, the people of God who are supposed to do what God has, even though God has sacrificed himself, has not. And yet, the consequences is taken by God himself. And for Paul, that is actually a declaration of power. It is the greatest power that is there. That the greatest power that the world sees is not in terms of political power, is not Rome or Pilate or Herod, but the greatest power is manifested in a God that even though you can spit at him and mock him and not keep your end of the commitment, God can still love you and care for you. That even though that as human beings and what that implies and what uh, Paul is implying here to those who accept Jesus as the Messiah is that in bringing together, in bridging, and it's a difficult thing to unite. It's really difficult to unite. You know, uh, Israel has a lot of history. They've gone through a lot of suffering. These people, uh, the Gentiles, have kind of lived a licentious life uh, ancestrally, and then they are coming into this covenant. But even though, because the God that you worship, the God that you follow is this, then you also, because you have received that mercy, because you have received that grace, you are called to come together and unite in it. That you can no more distinguish yourself from them. It's to push to unite. Why and how? Because you can. Because God is that cornerstone. Christ is that cornerstone. That is that. It says in verse 19 and 20, so that you are no longer strangers and aliens, uh, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. Very, it's a very profound idea that comes out here. And in one sense, it is um, when, uh, when Mahatma Gandhi goes to London, uh, he, uh, he joins a vegetarian society. And in the vegetarian society, there were a group of Quakers. Okay, Quakers are Christian, uh, they're uh, a, a subsect, a particular denomination of, uh, thing. you'll see them, you have Quaker Oats and things like that comes from that particular group, a very small group started uh, around the same time as the evangelicals, uh, but the Quakers always felt that they need to reform themselves. So they don't want to grow big, they want to reform themselves, whereas evangelicals in one sense have always thought to expand. Quakers said, no, we always need people to reform. And so they were all, uh, so it's a very small group of people, very strong Christians who follow the light of Christ. And so they had also part of the vegetarian society that is there, all right? Uh, and so in whatever ideas that they have, they felt that this is the right thing to do. And so when Gandhi first encounters Christianity, he first encounters it through the Quakers. And it is the Quakers who, re who tell Gandhi that you need to read the gospel. You need to read the gospels if you want to truly understand what it means, who, what Christ has shown himself to be. And so Gandhi accepts it and he doesn't for a while at, at one point, he gets a Bible and he reads the Gospels. And Gandhi in his own autobiography is writing, when I read the Gospels, it, it pierced straight into my heart. Like this God who sacrifices himself, all right, this God who's innocent, all right, Christ who's innocent, who sacrifices himself and the Jews who are killing him and for him to accept that one man's innocent to be able to accept that suffering for others. He said, this idea is too, it's, it's such a profound idea. And what he felt that it was not just a spiritual idea, but it's also a deeply political idea. And a lot of his, uh, what, his ideas of fasting, you know, his idea of I will suffer, and if I suffer, it can liberate the other. It's, it's, it's taken deeply from an Eastern Orthodox Christianity and from the Christianity that is there. There's, and he himself, right, there's nothing in his, in his particular worldview that, and he's amalgamated all this, but he finds that very deeply in Christ, in Calcutta, at the height of the violence that was there between Hindus and Muslims, uh, they were killing each other. So the British sent a whole army in different parts of Calcutta. And then Gandhi goes and he goes to a person's house and he fasts. And he says, I'm going to, I'm, by my suffering, uh, that I want to bring peace that is here. And so on the first day, uh, Hindus and Muslims are fighting against each other because they don't care about this thing. They say that to Gandhi. But on the second day, the fighting stops. On the third day, it, I mean, fighting reduces. On the third day, it reduces. On the fourth day, and there are ethnographic reports on it, Hindus and Muslims come together, throw their knives and throw their weapons in front of him and says, no, you will not accept the suffering for uh, uh, what we are doing. And we will, and so on the fourth day, it stops. Whereas the army that is sent in all other places, okay, the violence just perpetuates. 
No, it's not to glorify him or to say what he is doing or the acknowledge his worldview, but it's something that Gandhi is deeply understanding in and through the cross, that if we accept suffering willingly and voluntarily, it can bring redemption and it can bring unity to those outside. That you go deeper into God and it brings, it galvanizes and it unifies those around us. And it's an idea that resonated very deeply in him that he was able to bring out in some sort. Now verse 19 to 22. Now here is that whole temple idea that uh, we were talking about, which comes out very strongly here. All right. Um, so verse 20, we have built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. Um, in him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. And here you have the other major theme that he's bringing, the idea or the symbol of the temple that he's bringing into the discussion here. And it's always a very strong symbol. You know, what we are, whatever our views are on what is happening in the India around, we have to accept that what is happening is unprecedented. Something never before in the history of the nation. To unify and galvanize uh, a majority part of the nation towards one geographical place in Ayodhya. And for, it's, it's also like one of the things in the GM project that we do is to look into these and what these kind of cultural statements are saying. And you see flags of the Ram temple or Ram being put in the Ayappa temple in Murugan temple, in Shakti temple, which means that in the hierarchy of things that there is a dominant hierarchy that is there emerging. It is a way of centralization. It is a Semitic idea, you know, whether it's the Jewish temple or Mecca or wherever that you have, the idea of trying to unify people based on the symbolism of a temple, on a physical temple, on a physical temple being built, a material temple as a way to galvanize as a way to unify and there is power in that all right you see that even in old testament the first thing that they wanted to do after returning from exile is to rebuild the temple because it is a tangible symbol for unification it's a tangible symbol for bringing people together now here is the problem with it of course uh, at, at different points it becomes necessary uh, for people to kind of come together and to have those kind of symbols but how, why we see Paul completely breaking down that narrative here and moving away from it is just this. That when you look at uh, a temple made of brick and mortar, it's material, all right? It's a material thing that you make. And anything that is material that is made, it has to, in one sense, divide people in order to unify because it's in the nature of material things to be very limited. Uh, if I have 500 rupees here, and, and so that's the note that I have, 500 rupees, that's a material tangible thing, uh, and I want to kind of uh, divide it here, uh, I have to, and there are 50 of us, I have to give, what's the math, sorry, 10 rupees. Okay, 10 rupees to each person, that's there, all right. So the material thing has to be broken down and divided among each. All right. And it is in the nature of things that are material. A temple, whatever it is, it's the idea, the symbolism is, you know, for the Old Testament, bringing heaven and earth together. But whatever it is, the manifestation of a material thing. And you move away from the symbol to the actual codify, the material nature of it. And anything that is material inevitably has, does not have space for everyone. It is just in the nature of material thing that you have to divide. In one sense, there is, in Ayodhya, there is no space for both. Okay, it's also like, a, it's an idea that is there in the mind. All right, there is no space for both. You have to, in one sense, demonize the other in order to unify. And things in material nature have that. In order to bring people together, you have to demonize. It's the worst form of it. You find that even in gossip, there's a very strong social bond. But in one, what gossip does is, once you demonize the other, once you say something else about the other, it kind of unifies you. And temple, as physical temples have always, in one sense, will be limited in that aspect. That the material nature of it, the material reality of it, is that ultimately it is limited. You cannot move beyond the limitations of the material nature of it. 
and the, the Jerusalem temple, whatever, however it unified the Jews together, it ultimately has to exclude those who are beyond it. It cannot look, the function of it cannot push more. It's just the nature of material reality to do that. And what is also interesting is, if you go to Acts 21, Paul, where is Paul writing this letter, Ephesians? From jail. He's writing this in prison. Why did he go into prison? It's said in Acts 21. All right, so in Acts 21, we have 27 to 29. All right, so uh, Paul is preaching here. Acts 21, verse 27. When the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia, seeing him in the temple, stirred up the whole crowd and laid hands on him, crying, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who is teaching everyone everywhere against the people and the law of this place. Moreover, he has even brought Greeks into the temple and has defiled this holy place. All right. This is a false accusation, but whatever it is, it is the accusation. So the, uh, what the Roman governor or the Roman empire intervenes into this. Now, you would think, why does a politically a Roman empire intervening into a small a skirmish religious sect, Jews, their problem? Because for the Jews, their biggest problem is if you bring a non-Jew into the temple. It's a violation of the temple or do anything to that symbol. If you do anything to that symbol, it touches very deep into their civilizational cause. Okay? It, touches very, it hurts them very deeply that's there. And so it's interesting that the reason why Paul is in jail is because he brought a Gentile, or the false accusation is that he brought a Gentile into this temple. And for that, they bring the Roman government into this, and the Roman government puts him to a jail, which means that it's a big deal, all right? Because they won't make small matters, they won't have the year of the emperor and the empire at that time, which is a big deal that is there that it is in the nature of this material temple. And this is the experience that Paul has go through, going through. And I'm sure those experience has also shaped his thinking that now he completely uses that same metaphor or that same analogy that is there, the situation that he's going to, that physical temple, and then completely turns it around into his head. That yes, the idea of the temple still stands, but the idea of the temple is no more material, like what Noel was saying, it's no more material, but anchored in Jesus Christ himself. It, is a, it takes on a spiritual plane, that this bricks and mortar is now no more material, but things of an eternal value. And it is the nature of things of eternal value that can multiply itself. You know, you have two kids, uh, you don't love them 50-50, all right? You don't love them 50%, 50%. You can love them 100%, 100%. Why? Because it's in the nature of love, which is eternal, that you are able to take from God and be able to give it. Because love is an eternal thing. Whereas a 500 rupee note or anything material is temporary. It does not, it cannot replicate itself. And so the only way in and through this unity can happen, this bringing together of the different people of God is in and through what Jesus has done. It cannot be a human effort. It cannot be a mere, we cannot be the cornerstone. You know, I will be the cornerstone and I will bring unity. I will instantly collapse. I cannot, I do not have the weight to hold people in my extended family. That is there. That itself is a crumbling weight. But if God is that cornerstone, if God is ultimately the one on which we stand, and it is not just God. The minute we bring the idea of the analogy of this temple that is there, that means we also play a role in the building of that temple. That we, our role in being the actual brick and mortar there, that this deep interconnectedness that has to happen for this temple that holds itself together. And he says, the prophets, uh, the apostles, those who have gone before us, you know, one of the things that really affected me this past few weeks is seeing Shibu's body there. You know, Shibu has two children, you know, uh, we prayed so much, you know, at Uncle Arun's house, you know, I was just thinking the way in which they prayed, he will heal, you know, just the way in which they were praying for it. And it didn't happen, you know, uh, two children that's there, and I'm thinking, what's the point of doing all these things? You can't even hold your family safe, you know, one day this is what's going to happen. But the idea that is conveyed is, ultimately, we are all part of God's temple. There are certain visible aspects of this temple that we can see, but there's a much deeper invisible aspect of this temple, which is still prevalent. And he brings here, uh, uh, Paul brings that idea uh, here. 
in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into the temple. Uh, uh, and he says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, that those who have gone before, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, and then Christ Jesus being the cornerstone. In him, you also are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. It's an amazing analogy. And it's a very creative analogy that he's taking and that he's making. That ultimately our world is broken. That things around is broken. Things in our family are broken. Things in our work is broken. But if we are joined to the temple of God, if we are joined in the temple, uh, whose cornerstone has to be Jesus Christ, and the deeper that we can go, the greater that we are able to bridge these hostilities together. The greater we are able to unite to live in a land of love. Right? Let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this book. Thank you for the book of Ephesians. Uh, I pray, Lord, that we've uh, exposited it right, uh, that these are the words, and these are the words that Paul is trying to get at and reach at. Uh, um, we want to hold on to this analogy, Lord, the analogy of the temple. Uh, as we see our nation moving towards the material nature of it, uh, um, we move to another temple a temple in whom you are the cornerstone, a temple in which our lives uh, and who we are and our being becomes the brick and mortar of building this temple. Uh, we thank you for this temple, those who you have brought here. And we pray, Lord, that we will be a worthy house for you, a worthy dwelling place where we can hold one another up. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you, Jacob. <clears throat> Let's just bow our heads. And Father, we thank you. Jesus, you said, I will build my church. And I pray, Lord, for the building work that is taking place in our midst. And I pray each one of us will be willing to be joined together to become the dwelling place of God, joined together with our brothers and our sisters. And we don't get to choose them. Lord, you choose them. It's your building, it's your house, it's your, your temple. And I pray, Lord, that our lives will be joined together to become the dwelling place of God. I pray, Lord, for friendships that you give. We be faithful and true in our love for one another. And as Peter said, love one another deeply. There'll be a deep building of our lives together to become the house of God. I pray, Lord, you would cleanse our hearts of prejudice and our self-seeking ways which hinder the joining of our lives. I pray, Lord, we would lay down our lives to you in our love and worship of you, and in that place, you would join our hearts together to you and to one another. So Lord, will you do that for us? Will you do that for Bridge Church? Build us together to become the house of God, that we would know your presence in our midst. This house will be a house of prayer for the people who don't yet know you. Lord, this house will be a house where every joint is supplying the need of the other. Your life would flow and there'll be health and well-being in it. So will you bless Bridge Church? Will you bless it and make us a blessing to the people around us? I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.